Welcome everyone to the LinkedIn Power Lab webinar. Today is Monday, the 20th of September in 2021. And this is the episode number 24 in my series talking about LinkedIn. Today, the topic is refresh your LinkedIn knowledge. And you will see the letter R like refresh all over the place. So for those who are new to this uh, webinar, um, good to have you there. I'm very happy for that and yep. uh, you will receive the recording afterwards. I would ask you if, if, if possible that you could, that I would rather mute everyone. If you want to speak up or to chat, please do so. But first I mute everyone so that only I'm talking basically. And then we also will use the chat room. So then typically what I would like to do, I will add some kind of questions over there, but that might be also helpful for the further understanding. And I'm keen to get your input. So let's get started. What I would like to cover today is first about, for those who don't really know me about it, so then my name is Gunnar. I'm a social media consultant. I'm blogging about social selling. I created two online courses and uh, published some books. Um, so we use the chat room um, because I would like to make this as interactive as possible. Uh, and before anyone is asking where that picture has been taken, that actually is in the Royal Botanical Garden or let's say between that and the domain when walking to Macquarie's chair in Sydney a couple of weeks back. So now let's get into the topic. So I would like to show about refresh your LinkedIn knowledge, three topics. Number one is research. Number two is reuse. And number three is review. And at this stage, a kudos to our participant, regular participant, Bell, because sometimes when I'm not so sure what to talk next time, then I've been elaborating on the content, what it is. And then uh, while walking somewhere here in our neighborhood, uh, we both came on these ideas to do this. Also, sometimes the content I'm sharing for those who see these topics for the first time can be a bit overwhelming. So therefore you're always welcome to get the slides from the email that I'm sending out uh, and also uh, to watch the recording again. So therefore I'm actually reusing some of the slides that I used beforehand and give it into a new light. In that sense also, I would like to say hello to Leo. So I hope you are there. So um, that's good. And please also use uh, the chat as well. Hi so, Gunnar, hello. Hey, hi brother. So let's look into research. And having Karl here, who's Austrian, reminds me that I sometimes write for an Austrian magazine about opera. How can I write about opera when I don't know the target audience? So I need to do research. When I cover the Sydney Opera House to write about a performance like um, a very opera that I've seen earlier this year, then how can I do this without researching before about what I want to write, but also if it's relevant to the audience? Because if I write there in Vienna, it's a completely different thing compared to writing for a local magazine here in Sydney, where the Sydney sellers can go all the time. But those from that publication in Vienna, they might know that particular opera much better than I, than I do. So I would like to ask you in the chat straight away, I'm curious on your answers. I type the question, when do you typically research your LinkedIn content in the sense of on Sundays or ad hoc or once a month or something like this. I research daily. So I know that some, some of you like Bella writing three times per week. So, but when do you research? When do you look into what you would want to write? So Leo once a year. So let's change this to twice per year. I mean, for sure monthly. Because Leo, you are you're in you're in tax, so that means also some of your profession once a year might be in in June, July, when it's all about the new tax regulation or whatever's coming out. But I think it can be more often to showcase something and research for that. So that would be good. So um, who else has something? When do you research? Uh, Bell, your research on the days I post. However, I would like to be able to get into better habit with this. Habit is my last name. We can, I can help you on that one. So it, it might be different. So I've done the same question also in a larger group of company. And I figured out that most people actually do research when they want to write it 
if at all. Sometimes they're just white and don't really research too much. So let me tell you a story. So um, when we have here Olin, he has been once living in Mosman Cremon on Spofford Street. There's a cafe on the Mosman side, which is this one. And here is this cafe house, um, had a good coffee, but and here comes the but. People go there for coffee. I also went there because the uh, barista there, and you can see him, uh, he was the twice um, Australian champion for coffee roasting. Great guy. He was my neighbor downstairs. But then I heard about that they also have great cookies. But it's just my taste, maybe. So, and then they were not always available. That's a tricky thing. It's good they have it, but bad that whenever I come, I'm not sure if I get them because what they do is they serve coffee. So what if this cafe would then decide to listen into what customers think about the cookies as well as the coffee? So I, there are some research about cafes who do that, and then they adapted the menu. So then by putting out some kind of listening activities in a systematic ways, and then adopting a little bit um, the, uh, the cookies, then what happens, they get more clients. And then at the end, people come for cookies and they need to sell coffee with the cookies. But without listening what people actually like, it would never happen. So that is something which a business owner would normally do. So then Leo, if you serve your clients uh, from, um, uh, from, from your financial uh, advisory and, and for tax reasons, of course you serve them and you serve them every year, which is perfect because they have a reason to come back to you. But you can also serve them with something else. And listening is something which is very important. So welcome also to Paul, who joined now. So then uh, that's nice uh, salute and uh, guten Abend, Paul. Hello. So listening uh, is a very critical element. But how can we do this in a best way to create content? So why using social listening? For me, it's all about curiosity. I cannot write without reading beforehand. So and the only tricky thing, social media is a big beast. Many people are overwhelmed. So then also it's a confusion on which channels the customers are hanging out. So Carl is a watchmaker. If you would like to listen into social media to find out where your customers are, the question is, are they there at all? And when, what are they looking for? For a nice new, uh, new watch for the brands or they come for you for some repair or whatever. Every case is a little bit different and so many places to look out for. Difficult to gather information. And the tricky thing even, 96% of all online conversations are actually unbranded. That is where companies would like to get into when they can hear that people are talking about um, whatever new Patek Philip watch, then, then, then Carl might want to, if possible, even resell them. So therefore, how can we do this? We can use digital tools, like right? say Google. I mean, there are some people who Google their name to figure out what others are talking about them. There are some RSS feeds or tools like Feedly who can help there, but you can also use even other social channels. So if for example, Leo would like to diversify and offer other services from, from a financial um, uh, offering point of view, he can look into other either uh, channels like Medium, which is blogging, or Quora, which is Q&A type of uh, content, uh, or even what is more specific to the financial service industry. Yeah. So that is a way to first figure out what's there, what people are talking about, if that suits to your um, target group in terms of geography or age group, or if you serve more business owners compared to consumers, this type of stuff. But Typically, you would do research more talking directly to customers or maybe put out a survey on a website. So you say you, um, you normally share articles and information once at every month, so that's good. But you can pair this even more uh, with uh, social listening activities. The only thing, where would we start with that? Because all of us here are more or less entrepreneurs or uh, also um, business owners, but not corporate junkies. So then those who are in corporate sales offices, they might have, or marketing departments, they might have tools for this. 
but otherwise it's not so easy. By the way, um, by the way of introduction, so the number of Austrians who are named Karl are now doubling in this call. So that's nice. So that's, uh, I will I happily introduce Karl and Karl, not even sure if you know each other. Karl Braunschweiner and Karl Hartlepp, could be that you know each other, would be funny. So where can we do the social listening activities? So first of all would be on Twitter. And uh, before Bell, you ask that you're not on Twitter, it's not about to be there or to tweet at all. I'm not a fan of tweeting, I've done it twice in my life, but I can use Twitter to listen into some topics. So if I would like to know if certain topics are captured on, on Twitter, I can create lists. I need to hide them, but I can do, and I'm listening into people. I can engage with followers and lists and keep even secret tabs on the competition. So uh, Twitter is a different type of topic. I only use it for listening purposes. If I would like to write about a certain topic, about technical innovation or something, I look first what is taught about that. I can look even find about competition. It's an interesting one, just as a side, a side remark of that. But when we do the social listening and we figure out what type of research we can do, what our audience wants, we can create even polls to find that out. I talked about it last time. What we can do then, then we can look further into my method of choosing content. And I would like to show this as well. And this method of choosing content is a set of letters. It comes from a software called Trello. Does anyone know Trello? I think at least Paul, you might know it. It's a project management software that is a good way to put out like a board uh, where you can sort things. So here I've been using this for a new online course that I'm preparing. But it's been acquired recently by an Australian software company called Atlassian. But Trello for many people in software is the known name, but I found it that uh, the six words of how I create content, how I research about content fits well into Trello. T for trust. That's what we need to do on social media, not to brag about how good we are, but to build trust with our audience. R for results, not how many watches we are selling, or how, many, how many customers we serve uh, with, with a good tax advice, but rather results means, how can I help someone to achieve something. So I better have a case study to showcase how a customer used my services to go to the next step from pain to gain. Now, Paul, you also add their um, uh, T for trends. Yeah, that works as well. Of course, it's, it's true and you're good in that. So trust results. The next one is enthusiasm. I rather like to share how something great, some our passion that we have instead of something boring. I don't use E for education. I rather put the learning. I don't want to act as a teacher who says you have to learn this, but rather I attended maybe a webinar or an event. That's what I learned, what I uh, suggest others to, uh, to be educated on as well. So I'm the, in the same boat, so to say. The other L is lifestyle, which doesn't mean Lamborghini, but rather to show um, Topics like gratitude, how, how nice it is to, to be at this time in the year, what we can achieve despite all of the obstacles, but whatever we're making. And then at the end, we have all for opportunity. So out of six letters, the last one is about our offering. And even then not to say, like many people do, uh, to say, buy my 10,000 nails for this price. There's so many people who reach out on LinkedIn and say, I have this business proposal. If you're interested in press here, buy this shiny stuff. I'm against that. So always in, on, on this, and the way you research and the way you write, provide value in all posts, not value for us as writers, but value in the view of the reader. Post once per day, maximum twice. If we post too often, then LinkedIn will reduce that it gets spread further. Once per day is good. Pitch never, makes no sense and then produce in batches. So that was a question that I sometimes ask, when do you research, when do you write it? Ideally, I sit down one hour in the week, and then I write some content. 
And then I schedule this. So, okay, this is piece is good for Monday. That piece is good for Wednesday. I even put some kind of themes uh, on the days, what I write on Mondays and on Wednesdays and on Sundays, for example. So Trello, these type of values that make sense, whatever that means, particularly concretely for yourself. Um, and then the last rules are all with the P. Um, Bell ask, um, uh, do you write a number of posts in preparation for the week? Yeah, sometimes I write two or three at once, uh, or I know that which type of content I take and spread it across. Typically I've done on Sunday the whole week, even when I go on vacation or something. But at the end, it's not only about posting, but also engaging. And also, Marine, you asked, will this serve as a library? Yeah, good one. Let's take it like that. So that was just about researching. For me, it makes a lot of sense. If I have nothing to say, I better don't post. If I want to say something, I better come researched. LinkedIn is not that long, but at least should be crisp. People have no time to read. So that's what I see. So then what we can then do also is, uh, is to reuse. But before that, a question, how do you judge the audience who will like your post? I need to know my target audience and I serve more audiences at once. So then using hashtags is, is critical for this one. And I'll show you an example. Reuse, question to you. Very curious on the answer. Do you typically, typically repeat your content on LinkedIn? And I'm, so, I'm, I'm sorry without the warning, but to Carl Hartlab, as you're gonna call, Carl, you and I, we met once at the New South Wales Business Chamber. It was so good, the picture that we've taken. So I use it again on a post that I've done about one hour ago. So then the reusing can be possible as well and I mark it accordingly. So that makes sense. Yeah, Marine, you have done once uh, after two years uh, because if you, can, um, uh, if you can use something reuse, you can change it a little bit where possible. And as you in, in a procurement and buying profession, it would be actually very interesting because there's so much about selling. So use your content. The tricky thing is, if you reuse it, it might come in a different type of um, uh, context. So therefore, how can you ensure that the audience sees your post? So that's a tricky thing. Take this example, Gifford Thomas. He has a book about leadership quotes. He took something, but he didn't really add something on it. So then I ask myself, why does he do that? What's in it for me to read it? It looks even like advertising. I don't like it. I'm a fan of composing an enticing begin that makes sense to deep dive in. You can change it when you reuse something. So for example, the, the mentioned post that I've done together with Carl, well, the picture I used from Carl and myself from three years ago here, um, I changed the wording on it, the entrance on it, but the rest was a post that I've had last year already and I can reuse it again. The beauty is if you take some content somewhere, you add your own enticing begin on it, then, and you reuse it, something that already worked before, then you can even get the reaction of the wider audience, it gets broader in this. So that is a, that's an important topic. So reusing makes sense. Give an example, Bell, you are in the area of uh, energy healing and you show pictures with um, yourself in an environment. So then, with the change of season, you might want to repeat something like the beginning of springtime. You might look into what did you write about it last year. Uh, you might not use the same pictures then when, they, when we are heading into winter. So that's, uh, that's uh, the repurposing can be quite a uh, quite good one. So, but how to do it? So um, I'm a fan of using posts with images and get the first three lines right. So typically on LinkedIn, when you scroll the feed, then you only see three lines. And if you, if somebody believes I cannot count, you see three lines on this example. The first one, how to adapt to the new world of sales. And the critical important second line is free. So this is a text that, that I wrote, which has many free lines, which in my view is important. It's not a text by Kafka who didn't know that. Because if you scroll down, you would like to scroll a lot and don't have a big block. So it's important. 
So therefore, here it goes like this. You need to have one thing. You want the audience to press see more, that they get your message. Otherwise, they only see it. You need to have a good picture that makes some more sense. And then ideally ask a question, have a provocative statement, something like that. So, um, so LinkedIn would like to have more content, so you can have even 500 words on it, so that's okay. And you can show your expertise by adding a lot of points and write nicely. Three lines, see more. The other thing what most people don't really do is one thing. Use just text and nothing else, no picture. Some people say a picture, an image says more than 1,000 words, but you might not need that many words at all. So if I have a look at this example, I got inspired by one gentleman called Justin Welch. Uh, he's a um, former business owner, CEO of a software company in California, and now he's an advisor um, for, uh, also for LinkedIn. So I learned one thing. If you have a text-only post, then it's not three lines, but it's five lines. As you can see, the first line, do you need a blueprint of what to write about on LinkedIn? Second line, empty. The third line, I have something. Fourth line, empty. Fifth line is just an emoji to scroll more. So I don't have a picture, but I want them to scroll more. And I got 3,800 views, which for me is quite a lot for a normal post. For some people, it's nothing. For some others, it means a lot. So for me, 3,800 is quite good. So. How to create this? We would like to have that our audience can engage on it. In order to achieve this, we need to write for a certain effect. So write an enticing begin to make people curious. Use few emojis, don't overload, it's not Instagram, and write simple language. And then you can become a storyteller in KISS fashion. KISS as industry term stands for keep it simple and stupid. So let's have a look. That was the Trello formula that I mentioned earlier. That's it. Took me 10 minutes to write this post, 3,800 view. Okay, that's fine. Couple of likes, couple of other reactions, seven comments, good comments. And then I see who likes it. I see who comments it. When I see same people again and again, then it makes a sense for me to connect with them, to enrich my audience. When I've done that, those people can be my customer or they stand behind or in front of the potential customer behind. So I can enhance my network with suitable people properly with content. So when we have done that, we research well, we even reuse and we figure out how to get a good entrance into writing then we can get into review. So Bell asks, how did you manage to gain such an audience gain when it was text only? Mm -hmm. Exactly what I said, get a proper way to ask in it, put some content that makes sense, and then it's enhancing well. LinkedIn helps on text only posts more than we all think about. So this gentleman, uh, Justin Welch, he has maybe 800 likes on it. And up to, I think what I researched about him was one and a half million views. I'm not in that league, but that's good. So simply write something. So in your sense, Bell, in your healing business, write a question. Some, some fact that people might not know about. Did you know that energy healing works best in October? I don't know, maybe there's a fact, who knows? For example, the people would wonder why is it the fact Then you give a free line and then one statement about it and then an emoji like that and they want to read about it then they press on it that helps and then you add people not in the post but maybe in the comments and then you get it on they can try that i like it so what we need to review and for those who know me a bit longer like also all in and Paul and Carl, and you know that my father recently passed away, he had this exact Olympia typewriter machine, which one day when I go back to Germany, we can buy. It's exactly this, it's funny enough, uh, sitting on, uh, on, on Unsplash. I got the photo from, but I really like old mechanical typewriters. Love it. 
that by the way has a German keyboard, Quartz. So yeah, I really love that machine. It's funny. Review, question to you. Do you analyze your content outcome on LinkedIn? Do you check or you just post? I mean, you do. You're in procurement. You always need to check. I get that. <laughs> That's nice. Let me, let me tell you further what I mean with that. There's various ways how we can check. Meantime, Carl is rejoining. I lost him. That's fine. Servus, Carl. Welcome to me. So, analyzing the outcome. Leo, you don't. Uh, Marine, you invest the time to write and post. And Bell, you do a visual advantage of making comments in the post or after you post. That's a different thing. First of all, what to analyze? One way to analyze is this one. We view, we check who viewed your profile. On LinkedIn Premium, which of course costs some money, it shows up 90 days back. You can see everyone who viewed your profile. Apparently, they have a reason for doing so. So what you can do is to talk to them. Hi, hey, thank you for watching my profile. Is there anything that stands out for you? Can I help you? Whatever it is. It is like Carl has his shop in the city, and he would know exactly everyone who's queuing in front of his shop without telling him who they are. But then he has a list of them. And he might want to figure out if, they, if, if he can serve them. The only thing what it needs is LinkedIn Premium, but it's for free for 30 days. And if you want to go for the free 30 days to figure out if it actually works for you, you will even be reminded 10 days beforehand, LinkedIn tells you, hello, your free trial has still 10 days to go, otherwise you need to pay. And then you cancel beforehand or you use it. So this example here, I've been around 60 to 80 um, profile views per week. And then one day I enhanced my uh, content topic by adding cybersecurity. And then it grew nicely from around below 100 into 200. So of course I wanted to know why and who now watched my profile. So that's why this analytical topic was important. And back then I've been working at Noggin and I wanted to know who they are and how I can utilize or leverage those people. That was good. So let's look into content. So thank you very much, Paul. Danke, Mutsmesk, for sharing with me one post about uh, that England will be the first country to require new homes to include electrical vehicle chargers. Danke, Paul. It has been performing well with Paul. That's good. I never tried this type of thing. And I've been really, really um, important for me always to try and learn here. And I really wanted to figure out if when one piece of content is, is successful, how can I adopt this and figure out the rules and patterns behind? So I took this article, which you can see, it's the title of it is below the picture. It's an external link, which goes somewhere there. I put, I put it out that Australia is known as an innovative test market, but did we lose the position? Kind of provocative, so to say, and then I wrote about that. So what did I, what, how did it look like? So I looked the material, which I got it. So if you see the slides, you can click on this link, then you get my post and see how that worked. So I, it was sent to me by my best mate, Paul. Thanks for being in the call. I started with a hook and a rather provocative question. I summarize key takeaways of an article, what I like to do, which often helps. I kept the post brief to encourage reading, to see a lot of white space in it. I tagged the original author in it, Michelle Lewis, and, and meet him, I'm chatting with her. Well, it's good to be connected to, to a journalist always because they have content. I use only five hashtags. The one with, you can see those in purple color. The one with EV doesn't have to be there. Nobody follows this. But innovation has 39 million followers. That is the key. 
innovation. And I never used it before. That's also important. So I always use the same uh, hashtags in my content, then LinkedIn got used to it. Like in my case, LinkedIn, social media. But something new makes a big jump. And this is a good one. And the Tesla photo rocks, no doubt. So what was the outcome? 150,000 views. Never had so many. That was good. So 574 likes, 55 comments. The word innovation made it. Better to say not the word, but the hashtag made it because that's a big one. So how would we know which are the hashtags? There are books about it from Sue Parker, for example, who published the popularity of hashtags, which is changing, but it's good to know. So there's a lot of stuff on it. So 20 people reshared that. Three of them were my second grade connections, 15 my third grade connections who I would not normally have contact with. Two from company pages even. The question is, what are those people? Are they important to me? I'm not really in this innovation game, but uh, imagine back then on cybersecurity, it really was. So I'm keen to figure out who those people are. If somebody reshares my content, apparently it resonates with them. So the likelihood to tap into their network, to know about them is very high. That's good. Yeah, and also Paul, you said, try and write the hashtag in the text instead of adding at the end. So here I've done a combination of this. Normally I actually like to write the, uh, add the hashtags in the text because they are blue and bold. They turn purple when I click on it, but normally they are visible and that's good one. So, and most people actually share it with own, own commentary. So if you look this one here at the top right, so that person, uh, Dr. Um, Dr. Alain Mode, he at least wrote one sentence, but most didn't do that. So that really makes sense to add commentary. If you want content to be visible, that people engage and you can find customers from that, then share content and put yourself out there. Not just take this initial article, and then share it. But this was a good example. And then I looked into where the audience came from. So here we can see, and it was just before the call today, uh, 451 people from Amazon. That's good to know. Many people are salespeople. That's fine because that's my profession. 3,000 people came from New York. Didn't know that. Interesting. I mean, I cannot really sell something over there, but that shows how that grows. That's interesting on LinkedIn. And I can then say, I would rather like to have this in a more better geography. I can add, could have even hashtag Australia and so on. But at least Melbourne is there, Sydney is there. So that's a good one. Yeah. I cannot buy anything from that, obviously, but it's a good research because it's enough about it. And look on the left-hand side, Deloitte, Ernst & Young, Accenture, Infosys, data consultancy, these actually are companies I have been working with or I am working with. That's good, that helps. So conversion activities out of another article that I've had, but it adopts here as well. If you just share content, then it's not enough if you don't do anything with it. So typically within the first two hours of posting, we need to comment on the first reactions. Typically I would then have a checkpoint, a quick one, the evening, next morning, next evening, particularly when it's going fast. Keeps the conversation going. A typical uh, Guna tip would be to say, um, uh, after a while, I like my own post. And then I unlike it and like it again. So then the algorithm is triggering this and it shows it then for some other people. So, then connecting. So that other post here, it had its acquired winners, but similar to this one, was shared with more than 20 people. Don't know who they are, but at least for those people, I can connect with them. These are personalized invite and suitable and figure out who sends behind them, if relevant to me. Perfect. It's free advertising. That's the beauty on it. And then I can try to convert, communicate directly with, uh, with LinkedIn messaging. I can even use voice and video. If I further want to know when my content is visible, I can use other tools. 
This is one that I like from a company called Shield App. It's about 90 US dollar a year. And there I can get even the proper social listening from which area the audience is talking to, at which time they see my content, at which time in the day they see my content. Imagine one thing. Let's say we are on a Tuesday. The weekend was drunk. Some people like to enjoy. Imagine we are marketing manager at a company selling uh, aspirin or some other pills against headache. So we really want to know when people are writing on social media, oh, I still woke up with a headache from the, from, from the drinking over the weekend. That's exactly the time when you know this, then you place your advertising. So the listening is so crucial and important. It really makes sense. We can do this by ourselves. So these were the three topics I had, how to um, research something, how to reuse, and then also how to review some areas. Any question further on that? Let me see what was there in the, in the chat. Uh, Marine, all about big company, that's true, but smaller ones can be there as well. Um, about the words and the, and the hashtags, we can also research about hashtags. So that's an important topic as well. So for example, Leo, if you are in tax and financial services, then figure out which are those hashtags which are popular. It's quite easy to find that out. And then you can use them. It helps to elevate it further. So that's, that's an important one. Um, so the audience gain is important. So then, Bell, what you write? Will you please expand on a written only post and the like and unlike process? Oh, that's easy. Like and unlike goes like this. If I'm sitting on my post, uh, the, um, the text only post, which was this one, you can see there's 19 people who liked it. Plenty of more saw what 19 liked at that moment, including myself. I don't like my post fast, but maybe after a day, I click on like. After two days, and I look if, how the post is going, I unlike, and then I like again. And it's spreading again. That is how the algorithm works. Not everyone knows, but it's, a, it's at least it's a fact. Um, Leo, you sometimes use hashtags like audit or deductions. Yeah, the interesting thing is, Hashtags on Instagram, for example, are very often an impression or a feeling like uh, hashtag first weekend after lockdown. On LinkedIn, a hashtag is something that, is, that the algorithm is using to spread content further. If people are researching about uh, something particular like, like text, then at least that is helping a lot if you, if you add this on that. So, uh, yeah, Leo, I know you don't use Instagram for work, but I mean, some people combine all of this together and uh, the hashtags came more from Instagram side. LinkedIn only adopted it. The difference being, if you use LinkedIn to write content, you should have three to five hashtags, not more, because LinkedIn believes then you're spamming. While on Instagram, barely, rarely, there's a real sentence of content, but 50 different type of hashtags that nobody looks at because they all only look at the pictures. But you will be surprised how keen companies are to use Instagram because they have one target. They would want to get into what I wrote here, online conversations. 96% of online conversations are unbranded. That's big. So companies want to jump in if some people are talking about particular topics. Yeah, Bell asks, will you uh, go over how to find your audience and tie out your post to them, please? That's the, the topic of next session. So the whole area about um, target audience comes then, not today, because that is quite a bit. So in the meantime, we have also some others who joined, uh, also uh, George, Paul, um, Indrek, any, any further questions from anyone at this stage? Marine, Carl and Carl, both Carls. Not at this stage, otherwise you're always welcome.
Close the chat and ask further. Yeah, um, Gunnar. I mean, yes. I'm just noticing that some of the contents are being like published or being reposted after a week. Mm -hmm. Is that actually a technique for? I'm not sure what. But when I'm browsing my LinkedIn and I can see this, I already browsed this last week. Why is this being posted again? So um, is that a technique that people are doing? Some people do this because they believe if they share it again quickly after the message spreads further, um, I'm against it and believe it rather hurts because it looks like uh, too fast of repurposing. Of, uh, of, of doing the same. So normally if you post something on LinkedIn and then you put it somewhere on the blog, on your website, and then on Medium or ev everywhere else, Google, for example, doesn't like it and would, uh, would uh, basically uh, depreciate the content if you would search for it because it's duplication it makes no sense. So therefore, with what I mean with reuse is maybe after a half year or a year or to adopt to the season or something like this in the sense of uh, if Leo is writing about the tax season then you would Leo you would take something what you what you wrote then last year and reuse this and put the new rules on the new percentages or whatever is there to remind people on it uh, instead of always create everything completely from scratch so for that makes sense or for those which are in a more seasonal type of approach um, there, there indeed it's possible yeah, oh, sorry, um, Gunnar, but my question is, you can see that um, they posted it five days ago or six days ago. It's not like a new posting like a, uh, a day ago. That's or today. Yeah, that's something else. It means that content is visible again in your feed. It was already there or sometimes you now see something that has been posted initially five five six days ago and only now you see it. that can happen but that is part of the algorithm uh, that it tries to spread content further like these 150,000 that i've had now for today that on that post it was from last wednesday and it didn't didn't, didn't hit the 100,000 that fast it took a couple of days so it might be that some people see this only many days after because and also the interesting thing is um, I have a question to you. Maybe you can notice all of you in the chat. Let me let me say this: When is a post viral on LinkedIn? That means how many views it should have to be viral as a word. Does anyone know? Yeah, so the idea of viral is that something is then really spreading out to go to everyone, so to say, much more than normal. And uh, not sure, Paul, if you would know that, um, but I have the answer. So then it's not about when something reaches 50,000 that it goes much faster, something like this. But there is a rule, and that means it is three times your followers. So for example, when Bell with your 750 followers, if you have a post, which hits, let's say, two and a half thousand, three thousand views, then LinkedIn perceives this as a three times more of people that follow you as something very relevant and gets it to many, many more people than normal. So that's why Paul and I, when we both shared this one for the electric vehicles, vehicles we got much, much more than we had. So All right, may I stop you and ask you a question that um, yeah, sure. when you said that, um, when you said, is it the number of followers you're talking about to get to that point, yes. or is it the number of um, likes from the post? Because I no. get a little bit lost no. with that sometimes. The number of views. When my art, when my post hits, let's say, ten thousand views, I have seven thousand eight hundred followers. That's just normal, not likes, not comments, just views. But when it hits three times more followers, for me it's seven thousand eight hundred. So this means around the 24,000 mark, then it gets further. And I would see immediately when I refresh, it really grows. And that's what happened with this particular post. Mm -hmm. Really, really fast. Same for Paul, it happens as well. And I'm personally, I'm even 
amazed that it was possible to copy. Well, well done to Paul to give you so much success, Gunnar. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Um, it was, yeah, it was a, a real surprise for me as well because it went from, uh, in, in, in one night, it went from like 50, 1,000, 2,000. And now, like you said, Gunnar, after, even after a week or something, 10 days after I posted it, I'm like 168,000 and 900 people uh, liked it or engaged with it. It was really interesting. Um, and what I was actually gonna, going to ask you this night, <clears throat> is there a correlation with regards to the algorithm between your company, your job title, things that you express that you're posting about, it, your matter of expertise, as well as the post and the hashtag. So when you look at the whole picture, it looks Gunnar is a social media expert, works for, for a social media related company, has this Gunnar Habits blog and you know all the education that he's doing. So obviously, me as LinkedIn, I should promote his post because he's a sub subject matter expert in, in this regard, right? Correct. And that is exactly also how it works. So when, for example, if you had shared this post after six months of not posting anything, there would not be that same success, for sure. So I looked into how the current profile uh, is engaged about the profession and so on. And I think what helped here both on your and my side is that we tapped into something that we didn't always serve. It had a bit of a surprise element. I never had the hashtag of innovation, it's a big one. If I would, for example, take something completely different that I never wrote about, like healthcare, about something, um, whatever is important there, and I would find a healthcare-related hashtag that is very popular, I might also get into that range. But there's a lot in it here to make that happen. Um, I once had this in April with 143,000. I tried to repeat it. And the next attempt failed with less than 1,000, but I've done the same thing, I thought, but I haven't. When I really copied exactly the same principle, a similar type of content, then I achieved at least some 39,000, which still was viral. So just on that uh, note, excuse hmm? me, if you had less followers, say, for example, you and Paul didn't have the thousands and thousands of followers, you were like me at the very low level of, you know, of seven, whatever it was you said, um, then, and I, would that have made it less popular, this, when you put this out, would that have made a difference with the algorithm and the popularity? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't understand that very well. Can you explain to those well, of us? Well, if you that? had shared the same post, and we can even play this and do this uh, on your profile, by curiosity, um, it's three times your followers. If you have 739 followers, if I remember well, then it would be something like if a post uh, naturally gets you to this content up to, in your case, maybe 2,500, then LinkedIn would realize that by normal average, you would reach this. This one is already so much higher. And then it would open the doors more. Mm. It's not published. How the algorithm works. It's all like guess, the tall poppy guesswork. syndrome. A little bit like the tall poppy yeah, syndrome. Yeah, it's all it's all guesswork. And that makes uh, our profession of social media advisors so valuable that we can find out how that works. Thank so, you. but it's an interesting, interesting way to look at. I really, really like that. So um, so what uh, and how can I uh, can I help? So I know that Leo, you just wrote about uh, what did you write? I need to spend more time on LinkedIn. I'm far behind the point where I should be on LinkedIn and I'm happy to help you because I also help some uh, financial advisors and planners and tax consultants uh, in Sydney beforehand. So let me uh, shortly share what I would then do. So there are things how I can help actually. First of all, I'm happy for, for everyone to have a free discussion, half an hour to look into some type of ideas uh, how I can help. The next one would be to work on refreshing the LinkedIn profile. And it's interesting how many people still have a profile which looks like 10 years ago. So for example, I, I worked uh, with, um, with a beautician from, from Liverpool uh, today and she uh, had fantastic uh, presence on Instagram, but the LinkedIn still needed some work. So I've done an analysis to figure out how other uh, beauticians um, have their profiles. And they're not beauty at all, the profiles. I mean, it really looks like uh, 
paying no attention. And that is a pity because uh, while the target audience would not always say, I need to buy this type of products, but when you address content that fit into, into the target audience that they can see it, then that can help. The first thing that people would then do to figure out who are you as a person, as a business owner? Can I see the person behind? Do I want to work with you? And that sometimes it's hard to figure that out before meeting the person. But we have all competition. We see plenty of different type in that sense was a beautician lady. So I need to make a choice who I talk and call first. Leo might have another um, tax consultant somewhere in Sydney who does the same thing. But Leo is Leo, it's only himself. So therefore, this is what we can show there. And I help by refreshing the profile from a CV style into storytelling. And I also have an online course uh, with um, recorded content about that. Actually, I look on the course about four things, how to complete LinkedIn to the proper uh, online presence and person brand, how to connect properly, how to shape the right content, and then how to convert that. And it's all uh, with a C, but that's typically good enough. But LinkedIn is only one type of area. And for, for many, it's a question, how does this all fit together? Because you cannot really be an expert on all of the tools. So I'm actually creating now um, a new online course. I call it Your Online Business, Digital and Social. Um, that's how to launch the online world. So that's the inside, how it will look like. And it has basically a um, couple of topics. So it goes about the marketplace first. How does the ecosystem look like? The competition? So if I take for Leo, I would look other uh, other tax consultants, how they create their online presence. Then I talk about yourself, so like your personal brand, vision, mission, values, how to stand out and find your voice and so on. Then the digital world, uh, that means something like your website, what is the landing page, what's a capture page? What maybe would you require an autoresponder, like, like a MailChimp or whatever? And then social media, so, which is not everything, but it's one piece of it. And then how to combine it all together based on a five-week program from starting to learn until kind of a launch event that you're ready. So that all what I'm currently creating will have 25 lessons, three and a half hours of video content. Very practical. Very much looking forward to get that started and publish this by, let's say, middle to end of October. And then we'll be ready. That will be my online course number three. Very excited about it because it can help actually particular entrepreneurs, small business owners who only have pieces of it, but not the holistic picture. So that's what I'm doing. That's what I'm, what I'm all about. And if you have any kind of uh, need for some help in that area, I'm very much uh, uh, looking forward to figure out how I can help you. What I do, I also have my Facebook group, Organic LinkedIn Community, and uh, more than 600 people on it, and I'm posting on LinkedIn. So that's what I wanted to share for today, and the hour is nearly over. Any, any further question from anyone, please let me know. I'm happy to answer. So also, Paul, you said, uh, lockdown time should be used to study and get better in career and not just waste time and get depressed. Yeah, it's a good one. So um, we can cheer us up uh, all together on that. So thank you for that. Yeah, because you're locked in the you're locked in the house. You can't go anywhere. Uh, you know, some of us have lost time of work or reduced hours or no work. And what can you do? You sit on uh, Facebook all day and you get depressed and you and you don't do anything with your life. At least if you're using this time wisely and you get into courses and you can, you know elevate your career and your skills when you do get back to work you're going to be ahead above others and you're going to be able to actually outperform others that actually use this time to, to to muck around and do nothing and also at the end of the day you can get a certificate and you can post it and brag on about it on linkedin you know and say hey you know i've completed this course and all of a sudden you're going to get all these likes and followers and on whatever you know, yeah. because everyone wants to cheer you up. 
That's one funny thing what you should not forget. Not everyone is sitting at home. Having Karl Baunsteiner here, he goes to work all the time as if there was no pandemic. So some and so do I. The luck. Yeah, you as well. I know. But good I mean, for you. For, You're yeah, lucky. good. And mm. Leo, your Central well. services, Paul, that's the trick. Being a central service worker, you'll be still working. Yeah. That's good. That's good. But anyway, uh, the time shows also one thing, and I know this from my main profession, Social media made a big jump, in particular, not only on scrolling through a Facebook, but utilizing chat services for customer service over long time waiting on the calls. That made a big jump. So that's very interesting. So anyway, um, thank you all for joining. Appreciate I really, really enjoyed uh, all of the feedback that you've had. Typically, the way how that works, uh, if you have been registered and accept emails being sent by myself, then by 7 a.m. tomorrow morning, you will receive uh, an email with the slides and a link to the recording. It also gets on my website, linkedinpowerlab.com, uh, in about maybe half an hour, one hour or so, once the recording is done. So thank you, everyone, for joining. Any questions? Thanks further? a lot, Gunnar. Let me know. Thanks, Leo, Thank you, Gunnar. For, Thank for, you. for joining. Paul, good Carl, to see you. Carl, Bell, Thank Marine, you. Pauline, Thank George. you, Firma. Yeah. Thank you, Gunnar. It was very interesting. Thank you, Shane, Gunnar. Thank you, Shane. Thank you. Bye bye. Yeah. Servus.